So this uh, talk being just half an hour, sorry I'm repeating myself for those who have been uh, here a bit before, is obviously uh, it's a high level presentation about what uh, you can do with JavaScript in, and machine learning and what libraries are out there and what you know, um, current libraries are trying to overcome. So there are a lot of things that you can do uh, in JavaScript right now with pure JavaScript. First, you can do uh, cat recognition for those who like cats. So I'm just showing you. Uh, oh, insert. Uh, hopefully, it will work. If it does, sorry, I need. Ah, oh, here we go. And oh, it found a cat in the middle of the picture. I don't know if you. There we go. So you can do uh, digital recognition, which is a classic uh, uh, machine learning uh, example. So here I'm going to draw a seven, really roughly. Uh, recognize. Oh, it's a uh, recognize. Up. Uh, recognize. Here, it's rubbish. Oh, Ooh, it's very rough. Obviously, my handwriting is horrible. But um, yeah, as a interesting applications, um, so self-driving car simulations, obviously, uh, you know, Tesla being in the media and stuff, but there is a, um, the MIT did a, a, a course on self-driving cars and, um, and so there was self-driving Tesla and to simulate how, you know, you need to recognize or adjust the parameters uh, they, they've done this uh, simulation which is on top of a uh, famous uh, JavaScript framework called uh, ConfNet.js uh, and basically you can uh, model your red car and see how it goes and how fast you can go. Um, so in my presentation I have all the links that you need if you want to experience these uh, libraries. Uh, image manipulation uh, so um, to a file uh, here, Lighthouse, and you can see how fast it, how fast it is to actually uh, manipulate the data. So grayscale the picture, uh, draw the edges, flip the uh, picture or resize it, zoom it. Uh, actually, zoomed and flipped are actually uh, a bit reversed. But um, what else? You can do. Um, you know, for developers, uh, that's interesting, the automatic logo generator. So I'm going to try to do it uh, live. So CamGS, and if you go down, you'll see they, it generates different types of logos, that, you know, just to improve your creativity or add, you know, arrows to your creativity. Uh, the other thing, you, uh, machine learning, you not only work with uh, uh, numbers, you can work with words as well. So classic uh, example are spam filters um, and uh, yeah, e email uh, filtering. Um, or you know, when you work, when you have a salary on your iPhone or or a search boxes, uh, it's all about word processing, so it's called natural language processing. And there is also this uh, project that I found out on, uh, on GitHub recently, it's uh, AI for robots, so for those, um, I think Jessica, you talked about uh, sensor, and uh, Anna was talking about Arduinos, so this combines you know, artificial intelligence and Arduino and robots. So you can have fun with everything. And all in Node.js and Node. Very high level, uh, I'll try to expose the key concepts of uh, machine learning. So we oppose supervised to unsupervised um, machine learning. So supervised is when you, you have a specific set of inputs and you know uh, your output, you know uh, what to expect at the end of the day. So you're trying to find a, a function, if you want, that will map all the 
x variables to the targeted output y. So uh, typical, uh, uh, there are two types, like classification, when it's a discrete set of um, outputs. So uh, if you are, uh, you know, uh, let's say uh, you have um, a set of colors, so you categorize red or blue, or your emails, if it's spam or not spam, it's uh, classification problems. Then you have reg uh, regression problems. So regression is when the output variable is continuous. So it can be in dollars or weights. For instance, if you think of, uh, let's say you wanted to do a, a study on uh, um, property prices, and you would think of, uh, well, uh, what's, what's the location, what's the square footage, how number of rooms, uh, you know, uh, does it have a garage, a swimming pool, all those features, and you try to have at the end of the day how much your property would be worth. So that's kind of regression uh, problem. So examples of uh, algorithms that support that is uh, linear regression, uh, support vector machines, and random forest. Um, yeah, random forest is like a tree, and uh, basically uh, you do multiple trees randomly, you set up the parameters randomly, so that's why we call it random forest. Unsupervised learning is when you don't actually know the output, or you want actually to discover the different groupings and the different classifications uh, out of the blue. So. Um, you have clustering problems and association problems. So clustering, um, given a certain set of uh, data, um, uh, uh, it's used, for instance, in, uh, in, in the medical world. Uh, like if you have a, uh, a certain set of features, uh, uh, your sex, your age, uh, uh, your, your health habits, uh, uh, how, uh, how you, and, uh, or in biology in general, like if you have a certain set of features uh, or, and you group them, what type of uh, disease or what type of uh, plants you come to. Associations is to discover the rules among this data. So really at the high level it's supervised versus unsupervised. So that's a classic um, description of uh, uh, neural network, which is the, one of the main uh, algorithms uh, in machine learning. So you have a set of inputs. Um, so as I said before, for instance, in the uh, real estate example, uh, the uh, square footage, the number of rooms, that's your input layer. So you have a number, uh, the number of inputs are the number of features. And the output, so here you have two different outputs. It could be uh, uh, spam, not spam, or um, it could be uh, just one output, but uh, a price. Uh, you have an output layer. And in between the output and out, uh, and, sorry, in between the input and the output layers, you can have hidden layers. And there can be, uh, uh, like, it can be from one to n number of, uh, of layers depending on the complex uh, complexity and here it is where it's more an art than a science uh, to decide which number of hidden layers are in a network. Um, but this might not appeal to everybody in terms of uh, understanding of a neural network. I find sometimes it's easier to have this kind of representation like a typical tabular representation. So uh, the features are, um, you know, from uh, the, you can see in terms of widths of the data set, and the uh, number of examples are uh, like the height of x in that example. And so it's um, obviously it's, it looks like a matrix. And you try to arrive um, at the, uh, for e each example, you know uh, which output you're going to get. Um, so it's, you try to approximate the Y, the column Y that you have to, uh, next to the matrix. So you're trying to find out the, uh, the function or the, the weights that you apply to the, your data set, the, the X, and this approximation gives you a, it's called a Y hat, which is 
um, you know, what outputs given a current model. So uh, in, in mathematical terms, it would be just it's f of x gives you y, and you try to minimize y hat compared to y. I don't know if it makes sense to everybody. Yes? This one is, looks easier for you? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I don't know. This color. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, uh, I, I saw maybe the second representation makes you more like, uh, understand that you, know, you, you have all these um, number of examples, the output that you expect, the y, and we are trying, the game is really to try to minimize uh, y and y hat. Okay? And, we are, and to Basically, to do that, you adjust you 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 adjust the W, which are the weights that you apply to the number of features. What's Y hat? Y hat? Yeah. It's basically the result of your model of W times the X, if you want, the different weights that you apply to your oh, okay. data set. So, uh, basically, this. Uh, thing uh, called perceptron is just one part of, uh, let's say, what I showed in the picture of the perceptron is just this part. So you have a different number of inputs, you apply a number of weights in the middle, and you activate them, and, and you have one neuron in your network. So the, in terms of calculations, if you apply to your inputs uh, at different weights, you sum them, like in a multi-linear uh, regression, and you activate them, making them um, like you know a binary. Is it a zero or one? Um, do you accept it in your model or not? And so this perceptron is, or all the hidden layers and the output layers are calculated in that manner. You apply a different set of weights between the input and the hidden layers and a different set of weights between hidden layer and output layer. And you, at the end of the day, you try to compare the output layer to um, the calculations from your weights and the different layers to the output layer. And you try to minimize uh, this error <coughs> between what you've calculated and what is actual. Does it make sense? Does it make sense? So another key concept, uh, and it was discovered relatively recently, recently in that case means in the last 15 years, is uh, the concept of back propagation. So you can do these calculations about weights in one way, but really uh, for it to improve and so it, that uh, the network learns, you have this concept of back propagation. So the, you, you back the errors that you found out at the way that you calculate at the end of the day between the, um, the calculated output and the real output, you try to integrate it backwards into the weights, um, into the weights that are between the hidden and output layer and between the input and hidden layer. So how, um, so you reintegrate the error and it's a iterative process until you your error is close to zero, or as, as close to zero as possible. And that can be done, basically, uh, thanks to, um, because we all know the properties of the activation functions. So this is possible to, to go backwards, or to backpropagate your error, thanks to the derivatives. So activation, these are examples of, um, activation functions, so um, I, really you have to think of activation functions as uh, trying to squeeze a number here in this case for the logistic functions is between 0 and 1. You know that everything between infinity, in minus infinity and plus infinity will be squeezed between uh, 0 and 1. Um, ten, uh, I don't know how you say it in English. Uh, sorry? 10? 10H. 10H, okay. It's you squeeze every number from minus infinity to plus infinity between minus 1 and plus 1. And we can back propagate 
uh, and, and do this iterative process because actually, <laughs> mathematically, we know what the derivative of these um, of these different functions are. And I don't know if you have recollection from uh, uh, when you were doing linear algebra and maybe in high school or in, in college. So when you want, so most cost functions have a convex feature, okay? And so, um, you know what convex is? Like, it looks like, like a U, basically. And when you want to minimize, so to go to the bottom, to find the local minimum on a, uh, on a convex function, you use the derivative and try to go to the zero, basically. So you use the slope uh, of the curve in, in a convex function to try to reach the minimum as a local minimum. So that, that's how we achieve back propagation. And that's how we can achieve the whole uh, iterative process of improvement. So you calculate a certain output, you calculate the cost error and back propagate it into the weights and, you, uh, and then you, there is a learning rate which makes it improve every time. So these are the classic uh, cost functions, the uh, most I guess the most known one in terms of statistics is the mean square error. Uh, but you have a number of different types of uh, squares. Okay, enough math for today. Um, so, uh, so obviously all these calculations, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you need performance from your computer to, um, to realize this. And the browser, obviously, is not the, uh, the lowest level you can do your calculations. And most libraries would be in uh, C++. I don't think there are in any in assembly, to my knowledge. But they would be in a, in a very, in much more low-level language. However, um, when you handle calculations, it's often done in Python. And Python is just a wrapper around these C++ libraries. Um, that being said, if we are just doing uh, Python versus JavaScript performance comparisons, uh, most of the time JavaScript with the uh, improvements of the V8 engine and you know, the different browser engines, it's actually uh, faster than Python. Uh, it's just that when you do uh, deep uh, learning uh, networks, that uh, when you, you do like image recognition and not just of cats, because here it was a bit cheating. The cat was recognized because we could uh, find two ears, like, you know, the, the sign of, uh, so that uh, was a shortcut. But if you want to do it uh, at a production level, like, you know, at, at Google size, you need really like um, uh, a lot of GPUs to do that. And why GPU is because, uh, um, coming from the gaming world, uh, that's where most calculations for refreshing screens come from. And so they are very much used to uh, all the vectors and matrix calculations that are actually uh, used in machine learning. So uh, the leader in, this, in that field is uh, NVIDIA, or when you have NVIDIA um, a GPU card, um, they have actually also created libraries that enable you advanced mathematical operations on it. So um, in the JavaScript world, we are used to the simplest way to do that is array of arrays. But it's actually not the most uh, uh, performing way to do that. Uh, for accessing uh, a particular item, you would do uh, what, you know, given a, a matrix A, an array of arrays. You, uh, you access your um, elements by, you know, I mean, uh, A, I, J, which, you know, I'm sure everybody uh, would be able to do. But it's not, if you want to iterate over that or access or transpose or um, this matrix, it, it, it won't be very fast. Uh, one uh, faster way uh, to do that is uh, to use typed arrays. Uh, which is my second e example. And um, it's, it's faster, but the thing is here, the, you, you can see this. So this is a, the same matrix as this one, but it's just flat. It has been flattened. And here, the index is, uh, so as you can see, it's uh, 
three uh, rows and three columns matrix, and here you can see that uh, the index has been fixed. So one, uh, so it's very fast using typed arrays, but to access the the different elements when you want to do uh, uh, higher order operations uh, is is a bit cumbersome. So there is a compromise where this index, the three in my example here, is actually um, it's it, it, sorry. It, it's a general linear function. So here. It, this um, formula basically becomes to that. So, um, so here you can uh, really switch rows and columns very quickly. You can transpose numbers in your matrix much quicker. And there has been a, a library that uh, has uh, used this idea of strided arrays, um, and uh, which is ND arrays. Uh, it's used in a number of uh, uh, low level and high level. Um, uh, libraries, uh, NumGS, which is a kind of NumPy for those who are familiar with uh, Python, that tries to uh, use the same kind of um, uh, functions that uh, yeah, NumPy or MATLAB have. Has Keras uh, takes the name of uh, of a famous uh, library, which is a, a higher um, Order library, a higher level library uh, on top of TensorFlow or uh, Tiano, which are more lower level or matrix calculations. So, Keras, it would be easier to do uh, uh, artificial neural network, uh, uh, recurrent neural network. Uh, it's it's good for prototyping uh, uh, machine learning uh, models. The only thing, uh, the Keras JavaScript model. You can only, in a way, do uh, forward propagation. You can only do what's called inference and not back propagation. So the training of your models won't be done in JavaScript. It would be done in, um, in Python. And then once you have your model, uh, you use JavaScript to visualize these things. So TensorFire is the latest library. Um, it uses NDRS, but it also uses WebGL uh, under the hood. So um, other ways to do calculations in, uh, on the CPU is using uh, WebAssembly. There are fewer examples of that, and they are uh, less mature. Um, but it's uh, certainly um, avenues to explore to Im improve the speed of calculations on the CPU. And also to increase the the parallelism of calculations in uh, browsers, you, you, you can use service workers. That being said, there is a cost of transferring your data from a, um, your browser thread to the service workers and back. So there will be a slight delay compared to pure uh, CPU. So as I mentioned, uh, you can do calculations leveraging your CPU or you can leverage uh, WebGL. So a number of, uh, of libraries have emerged, and uh, the latest one being TensorFire, which was, I uh, saw that on Twitter like uh, two weeks ago, so it's really recent, but um, they haven't, for the moment, open source their code. So as I said, I found a NPM library, but I couldn't find a, a GitHub. Uh, basically, it uh, leverages uh, JLSL, so the, the, the language that is used with WebGL. You can use also uh, leverage uh, your GPU differently using OpenCL or uh, WebGPU, but then uh, I guess it's not, uh, it will be a different setup. It will be using a node rather than purely the browser, and usually it's, uh, you can it's restricted to a certain number of browsers. It's, it's not cross-browser compatible. Right. Um, so that was my high level uh, in terms of concepts from machine learning. Uh, I, ha I wanted to explore a, a, a number of blogs and um, libraries that you can use um, 
uh, in JavaScript or courses if you are interested in the area. Um, so this Borak Camber did an old blog uh, in machine learning addressing not narrow network but a lot of uh, uh, unsupervised learning algorithm. And the second one is um, that I mentioned here, Andrej Karpasi, is, is quite interesting because um, this guy is uh, relatively famous. He developed one of the first deep learning libraries in JavaScript called ConfNet.js uh, to do convolutional neural networks on pictures. Uh, and he's, uh, he used to work for, so he's from Stanford, and he used to do uh, work for OpenAI, and uh, recently he has been he has been hired by Tesla to improve uh, machine learning for cars. Um, so there are a number of uh, uh, JavaScript specific uh, resources. Um, so ConfNet.js unfortunately is no longer maintained. TensorFlow, uh, you have a, a nice TensorFlow playground to play with which is here you, you can add a number of hidden layers, uh, different features, and you can, uh, so it's nice to play around in terms of what you can achieve and how long it takes to, um, to improve your model. Um, so it's TensorFlow playing around. So it's, it's a really, it's written in TypeScript and uh, it's only a very small set of the TensorFlow library. Do you know actually, do, do you, people understand what a tensor is by any chance? No, no? okay. So you should uh, think of tensor as a container, um, like a, a number, a scalar, would be a, a <coughs> tensor of, of size zero, uh, a vector, so I'm gonna go to so a vector would be a tensor of uh, one dimension. Um, a matrix with rows and columns would be a tensor of two dimensions. And uh, a cube, so three dimensions, would be a tensor, flow, uh, a tensor of three dimensions. So it's, you have to think of it as a container. So libraries, uh, and if, if you are more interested, so you can get involved uh, at different levels. Uh, maybe some like to go into the uh, lower level, so the matrix and vector calculations, uh, or you can go higher level and talk about different types of architecture. And ConvertJS, um, and more recently, this one, NeatOptic, um, which tries to do neuroevolution, so neural evolution, for those who don't know, it's, it's kind of, uh, um, uh, it tries to, it's a gen kind of genetic algorithm, which means that they, um, let's say, you can to randomly generate a number of, uh, uh, of examples, and basically you, you, try to, the, you try to eliminate those who don't work as much. So it's, it's a very Darwinian process in a way. You generate a number of, uh, of examples, you, you keep the ones who survive the longest, then you regenerate a number of set of examples, and, and, and so forth. Back in, so, um, so th there have been a, a number of um, universities uh, involved in uh, uh, to do m machine learning in JavaScript. Uh, one, would, I would say, is more um, on the edge is uh, from the University of Tokyo, MyLGS. Um, they do uh, libraries which are relatively very Japanese uh, friendly, like Sushi2, Tempura, uh, Sukiyaki, but they have uh, like Sushi2 is for instance for a matrix calculation, Sukiyaki is for on top of Sushi2 to do different machine learning models. Um, they do um, distributed computing, so they have created a framework where you have different browsers and basically you leverage the capabilities from you know maybe using WebSockets so you can connect different uh, computers, different browsers, and you leverage the 
the CPUs of these different browsers. Um, you have two, uh, one Swiss university, which um, the, the other two universities are, are maybe less known or less marketed in a way. Um, I, I had really, I learned just by chance that they uh, existed and they have actually quite a few uh, uh, libraries uh, on NPM or on GitHub. Um, the last one actually doesn't have a um, uh, NPM, but it does have a GitHub. I asked them if you wanted to leverage NPM, but uh, the guy didn't see the point of using uh, uh, JavaScript with Node.js. I don't know. That's his point. But they have a nice uh, online uh, laboratory where you can uh, actually um, download uh, uh, some files and you can uh, you know, use the uh, most common machine learning uh, libraries on it to you know, try to um, uh, create a model. Um, Coursera, I personally, so I'm not an expert in the field, I, uh, I'm, I'm still doing it actually. Um, I recommend the Coursera course from, uh, uh, from Andrew Ng, who, is, uh, uh, who used to work at Google um, and, uh, and Baidu. He was a chief uh, uh, machine learning or chief artificial intelligence guy from Baidu, the, the Chinese uh, uh, company. Um, Jeffrey Hinton, um, so his course on neural networks in Coursera, uh, Jeffrey Hinton is one of the... Uh, leaders in machine learning and it's, uh, it's quite um, unique that you can find his you know, a course from him um, completely free on Coursera. Udacity um, proposes a number of, um, uh, of uh, nano degrees in the field. Uh, the example that I showed you on deep traffic, the uh, MIT course, a lot of people from the self-driving car engineer uh, were involved in that, so uh, I, don't, oh, I don't have a network, so unfortunately I won't be able. But basically, they participated in in this uh, in this setup as well. There are lots of resources on the internet, uh, uh, blogs uh, which are not uh, most of the time not uh, JavaScript specific. The so JavaScript ones are the these ones that I mentioned. Um, Yes, so you can get involved also to encourage getting involved. There is an AI grant where for whatever projects and TensorFire, the latest library that I mentioned, they uh, participated in the AI grant competition and they won 5,000 from that to, to when they created TensorFire. Or Kaggle. Kaggle actually was co-founded by the, an Australian a guy, and it's a, it's a website where people uh, can do machine learning competitions, and, and there are open data sets, and there, there is a forum where you share your tips and tricks to improve the accuracy of your models. Sorry, that was very fast and, uh, you know, very involved, but if you have any questions, happy. Sorry? Yes, sure. Uh, yeah, I will put this. Uh, yes? Uh, How is using the GPU for graphical, for um, machine learning activity on a mobile device affect um, screen rendering? Is it going to. Uh, if you've got an app that is graphically. Yes, yeah, so tons of fire. I think you can try the, uh, the demos that they have on your mobile. Uh -huh. uh, I personally don't know. Uh, you know, the performance uh, comparisons for that. Uh, I, I, the, one of the things is, it, it, I guess the calculations would be, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think your GPU on a mobile is, in terms of power, it's, it's great, that great. Um, so I don't think, you know, um, I mean, it will improve a bit in a way because it's parallelized, so it's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, in parallel to your CPU, but in terms of pure raw performance, I don't think it's great. That being said, uh, I know that uh, uh, Google with TensorFlow has tried to, you know, uh, I mean, 
democratize the use of its library, and so they encourage it, and they do Android apps on that, but I personally haven't tested it, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, matrix, like, uh, the, with the weights, yes. uh, how are the weights? So the weights, you have to think it's the same set of weights that you apply to the n examples, okay? So you apply to all of them. So um, you can vary the, um, you can vary the output. You can yeah, so it, it, obviously it's okay. different set of inputs, but basically it's n. And you can see it's n. There are a number of features, there are n number of features. You multiply each feature by its weight. Okay, but how do we determine the weight? What, what? You just experimentally. So, that, yes, so first it's randomly generated. Okay. And then, so, so first you randomly generate these weights. So then you do the, act, uh, the calculations, so the, like the matrix calculations, okay? You activate them using one of the functions that I showed you before, and um, you do that for every neuron, every layer, and gives you y hat, the what comes from your weights. Okay, so then you try to calculate a cost. You have a cost measure, so the most famous one is a mean square error of comparing. But it's basically. Uh, Y, uh, y minus y hat square divided by the number of examples. Okay. okay. So once you have that measure of error, okay, you you back propagate this error into thanks to the derivatives of the activation uh, functions back to the initial input. Okay. So it chain and and then it's an iterative process thanks to a, what's called a learning rate where you at the end of the day, you will, meet, you will diminish the error that you calculated. Is okay. it clear? It's sort of clear. Um, I mean, I'm happy to... We, we can go over uh, a numerical example or a coding example if you want on a, you know, this afternoon or whenever yeah. you want. So, yeah. What kind of question can you deal with? Because I feel like this model being like a linear regression can yes. only deal with a certain number of complexity, like in terms of tensors, like the number of, uh, I suppose, dimensions that you can work in the problem. Is it just for like a two-dimension problem? And then anything after that, uh, the error rate, you know, just can't really model it very well? Um, so actually, the fact that you have hidden layers and, and you have... Um, so it improves, uh, if you want, the non-linearity of your problem. So let me show you what I mean. So you're thinking of, given a, a set like that, you, you can see it's, it's not linear. If you were just doing linear regression, it would be a straight line, OK? So if you were doing just input outputs, that's what you would expect. It's a, it's a linear regression. But the fact that you implement a hidden layer in the middle give Improves the non-linearity of your uh, of your model, if you want. So uh, I, I've done that example in, in JavaScript. So uh, just logistic regression and just input output without hidden layers would give you a straight line. Okay, but if you had um, a hidden layer, and and I said, I mean, here the code is in Python, but I've done the same in, in JavaScript. You, the fact that you introduce a, a hidden layer, they will find, um, you know, here, uh, so you can see here, this hidden layer is for hidden layer size 3. You can see you, you add a non-linearity to your problem. So, and the more you add, basically, the more precise in your non-linearity you can go. Okay? So then it's a complex, then there is, I mean, I didn't want to go over that, but, you can overfit your data. So then, in terms of, uh, if you want to predict, you know, a set, uh, a set uh, with your model, you have to be uh, very careful about that it doesn't over that your model doesn't overfit your test data. But if you do that, what's the cost in terms of processing? 
uh, obviously it adds like numerical complexities. Uh, um, I, I mean, uh, I, I, I don't have the exact answer, but you, you know, it's, it's adding a row. It's basically adding uh, a few matrices to your uh, to your calculations. So in terms of, uh, I know computer scientists calculate in terms of O or something. Uh, it, it, it would be at least uh, I mean square uh, added square capacity. Any other question?